got a big turnout. Now, where was he? Berkeley for a long time. He was with Lawrence Livermore. Right back in the early Unix security book days, he was one of the authors. Unix. I was just singing its praises to someone. I was just telling people that there's there's seats up front. Okay. Maybe. Louis one could bring in a couple more chairs. We're maxed out. Okay. Try and bring a few more up. Yeah. Tell tell Katrina and Natalia. If I could ask people to go ahead and take their seats. Whoa. Now they have this set on maximum. Thank you very much for coming out this morning. And uh, I want to also thank our speakers and our panelists for giving up their valuable time. Um, I think this is going to be a really uh, interesting event. There's been a lot of changes in cybersecurity in the last couple of years, and this might be one of the most uh, dynamic. It might also be one of the few things that could actually come to fruition in the next, uh, the upcoming months. So, we're very eager to have a, a full discussion. Today's agenda is we'll have three keynote speakers. Following them, we'll have a very distinguished panel uh, come up and have an interactive discussion with uh, the audience. I believe each of the speakers has time for one or two questions. Is that right? Um, and then uh, we'll see where we go from there. We put biographies of everyone out on the desk by the entryway because all three of our keynote speakers here have had such distinguished careers that it would take up almost the whole session for me to go through them. Uh, I'll skip that and instead say we will begin with uh, Howard Schmidt, cybersecurity coordinator for the Obama administration. He'll be followed by Cameron Carey, general counsel at the Department of Commerce, and then Michael, Michael <laughs> English is not my first language, uh, Michael O'Reardon, uh, chairman of the MOG, the Messaging Anti-Abuse Working Group. So I'm eager to hear the remarks. Uh, let's get started with Howard. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, Jim. And uh, thanks uh, not only to you for your personal contribution, but also CSIS for their ongoing efforts in helping support the cybersecurity effort and putting on events like this. Uh, as Jim mentioned, uh, we are very fortunate today to have some uh, really excellent speakers and panelists. Uh, to discuss in, I think, all of our views, otherwise we probably wouldn't be here, very important issue, uh, and that's specifically what role, uh, very broadly, what ISP should play in dealing with some of the security issues we deal with online, and specifically about the role of, of the relationship with consumers. Uh, there's been a lot of work that's been, uh, that's taken place in the past looking at these issues. Uh, we've seen things take place internationally relative to this area. Uh, and so some of the things we'd like to sort of flesh out a little bit today is, you know, what's good for us in this country? What are the things can really be helpful? Uh, also, as Jim mentioned, uh, we have a, a good friend and, and someone that really understands this uh, as well as anybody from the Department of Commerce, uh, Cam Carey. Uh, he'll talk a little bit about some of their efforts to pull together multi-stakeholder groups uh, to create uh, issues, or is look at issues relative to the ISPs and various code of conducts. And, and they've really, really been uh, leading in this area, and not only this specific area, but also in working with the private sector uh, in an area that basically extends beyond just critical infrastructure. Uh, Michael Royden, Royden, see Michael, Jim's got me started on this now, uh, from MOG. Uh, as I think many of you know, Michael has written extensively on this topic, including an IETF RFC on remediation of bots on ISP networks, uh, which is well received by the community and is also a very worthwhile document. Uh, as we go through uh, the questions to the panel, uh, I would ask you to once again be as you normally are, and that's don't be shy about asking questions. Uh, these are tough issues. 
And the only way we're going to get to the, the uh, solving some of these issues is to make sure we're asking those tough questions. Uh, in a venue like this, we have an opportunity to be small enough, focused enough to really come up with some good conversation to help us move forward in this area and dealing with this uh, important issue. So before we get started, let me, let me just take a few moments and, and reflect on where at least we see uh, cybersecurity is heading. We all know that cybersecurity issues uh, are, are here. They're not going to go away. They're not something that someone someday is going to wake up and say, yeah, I'm tired of messing with networks and we're just going to quit. Uh, nor are we going to be in a position someday where we're going to be so secure that people say, yeah, no, no uh, money to be made in this. Let's go do something else uh, uh, and, and stay away from networks. That's not going to happen. The president highlighted this in his 2009 Cyberspace Policy Review uh, and by creation of this office, once again, a reminder, Dual had it between the National Security Staff and the National Economic Council. Now, I think none of us are idealistic enough to believe for a moment that the issues we're dealing with are going to be somehow solved by a silver bullet or any one action taken by a company, an individual, or a government uh, is going to fix all the problems we have. But once again, having said that, we fully should recognize that there has to do, we all have to do a little part to make this more secure. We have to do something to move forward. Uh, we've said in meetings endlessly about we've been admiring the problem for too long. So looking for solid solutions and moving forward, as difficult as some may, may be, is something that we wind, that we wind up uh, uh, really need to work towards. When we look at the moving forward, what does that entail? Well, I think it's a combination of efforts. Uh, we look at the role that we all have to play, and you know, you've all heard this quite a bit about the role of government is only a small role. We have to make sure that the private sector, small businesses, state, local, tribal governments, territorial governments, foreign governments, individuals, pretty much everybody on the planet that has the use of this technology has a role to play in this. When we looked at the international strategy that was released a few months ago, Clearly, it laid out the president's strategy for how to deal with these things, not only in an international basis, but also working amongst the private sector and various governments. But in order to be able to make some achievements in this, we have to understand what our role is. And that's one of the things that we are constantly looking to better define. What is the role of government? What is the role of private sector? What are we as individuals can do? So let me drop down a layer, if I may, and just focus on the issue of, of botnets, which we hear a lot about. There's been some recent uh, interruption of some botnets that have taken place. We had some really good work done by the Department of Justice working in concert with private sector and the ISPs not too long ago, disrupting a very, very uh, uh, widespread bot network. But once again, when we look at these, this category, I see things fall into, into basically four categories. You know, the first one is sort of the awareness prevention, and I'll come back to that in a minute because I think that's going to be a lot of what we're going to be talking about today. But specifically on handling and inf an infection, first we have to detect that it's there. And I remember a, a few years ago when my, before my dad passed away, and some of you heard, uh, he was, had quite an affection for computer systems. Uh, and he was late 80s, early 90s, and every time I turned around, he wanted an upgrade. But also every day, it seemed like every day, I was getting an email forward to me saying, isn't this a virus? Isn't this a worm? Uh, and it got to the point, well, thank you for sending that to me. Uh, very much a prayer. appreciate your sharing. But with his penchant for computers, he also became, in the community he lived, sort of the computer guru, which was really, really scary, by the way. Uh, and I remember going down to visit him one time, and he, taught, he asked me to go over and talk to one of the local uh, women, I think she was in her 80s at the time, that she bought a brand new computer and it was running really slow. Uh, and some of you will really appreciate this next comment. Went over the house, looked at it, and the uh, DSL modem, the light was flickering like there was so much data moving back and forth. And the computer was just sitting there and idle. Uh, pretty, pretty good indicator that it had been bought it. Uh, she had no idea, no idea what it was, no, no idea how to clean it up. Uh, so this whole detection piece is something that if you can think people that you know that would be in a similar category, they have no idea. They think it's nice that those lights are blinking all the time. <laughs> uh, and so detecting is an issue we have to deal with. Then the second piece of this is actually being able to do, do something with it. Who do we notify? Who do we contact? 
Uh, you know, it's not as if uh, people go up and open up what used to be in, in some communities, the yellow pages or get online and say, you know, computer infection specialist and there's somebody right around the corner like a plumber would be. Uh, we have to figure out a way to better address this issue, to be able to notify the people that, that there's something wrong. And then the whole remediation piece of it, and that's something that we, uh, uh, we see some good tools out there. Uh, but often cases, because of one or two, people don't know that the tools are available, how to get them, how to use them. So that's something we need to, to wind up uh, uh, dealing with. So I mean, we could probably drill down in any one of these topics and literally spend days on it, on how to, to fight it, how to clean it up, how to deal with it. But the bottom line, it exists, and we need to figure out better ways to dealing with it. So if we think, those of us that are in this business that have a... Uh, whether you're a journalist or whether you're a technologist, while we think that uh, this is a challenge for us, imagine how the lay people feel. Or as I once said, when I had a technical problem and the help desk sent exec support over there and said, here, it's fixed, and the question became, well, what do real people do? How do they get this kind of support? So we have to look for reasons to do that because the botnets are out there not only can, can harm and threaten any of us out there, uh, but also... Is it become a victim of a crime, but it's also used to, get, to commit other crimes? So not only does it steal data from the computer, but it's also used to infect other computer systems, and often systems that trust that computer to be part of their, their trusted network. So as a consequence, there's a lot of work we need to do in this area. When we look at some of the things that we need to do forward to incentivize people to do this, and there's been a lot of discussion is what does it really take to get people to pay attention uh, when you really don't know you're a victim or when you're a victim, there's no real loss to you. Uh, but I think overall we fully recognize in industry there is a loss. There's a lack of confidence. There's a lack of trust. And we really have to go a long way to clean this up. And I truly believe that's why this is an important discussion topic and why we're here today to talk about it. So let me go back to what I said. Let me uh, wait for a moment. That's the awareness and prevention piece. And let me turn to that. This is different because it's not a responsive action to an infection. It's basically the awareness is, prepare, is preparing yourself to keep from something that from taking place. Uh, it's, you know, when we look at uh, National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, which, is, which kicks off this month, we look at the things that we try to do through Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and that's prevent these things from taking place. I've heard a lot of people talk about how great we are as a country to recover from bad things that have happened, whether it's a physical event, cyber event. But the bottom line is we have to constantly get better about preventing these things from taking place. And this is an area where it's, it's most important to do that because we depend so much on these systems. And so when you look at the botnets and look at the capabilities that that will bring, that someone could turn that against a company, an individual, uh, a, a publication, you name it. It's something we need to take care of and take very seriously. So as we work through the year, uh, like many of these things, uh, you know, we, we have Mother's Day, where well, we have Cybersecurity Awareness Month. But the same token with mothers, we should always treat them respect. We should always make them happy. Cybersecurity Awareness Month, we should not just have it for one month. We should do it year round. We should make sure that we're doing the basics all year long that we should, we're teaching and talking about during Cybersecurity Awareness Month and really implement some of the things with the Homeland Security's program on Stop, Think, Connect because that's an awareness campaign that really brings us to the forefront of what we should be doing. So in closing, uh, I thank you for the opportunity to make these comments uh, as, I, as I think you will take these to heart because these are four areas that we need to work on. I think we've got the right folks here to help us make that happen. So thank you very much. Thanks. Beat me to the punch. Okay. Oops. Well, good morning. Um, the pri public-private partnership uh, on botnets that's the subject of this morning's forum is a prototype of the uh, kind of policy making and problem solving uh, that we at the Department of Commerce have been advocating as uh, uh, a s central way of addressing uh, the key uh, 
policy challenges that we face on the internet. Uh, it puts into action the multi-stakeholder uh, approach that is modeled on the institutions that have so successfully built the internet uh, itself. Uh, it represents the kind of dynamic, flexible regulatory uh, approach uh, that we believe is needed to adapt to the challenges of rapidly changing technology. Uh, and this approach advances uh, the central policy of maintaining a trusted uh, and a secure internet while protecting the innovation and the interoperability that have made the internet such a driver of economic growth uh, globally. Uh, as The Economist writes this week, uh, the internet is shambolically governed. Um, and the shambles is a lot better than the alternative. Uh, we simply uh, cannot in this diverse, interconnected, uh, complex space uh, rely on a top-down approach. So under the Obama administration, the Commerce Department has made the internet central to our mission to promote growth, to create jobs, and to re retool the U.S. economy for sustained leadership in the 21st century. I, as Howard mentioned, the uh, work of cybersecurity is dual-hatted under the National uh, Security Council and the National Economic Council. And I'm grateful for, to Howard for being a leader in recognizing that the mission of cybersecurity uh, must uh, take into account economics, must take into account the needs of businesses. Uh, um, and so really making those interests uh, a part of the discussion. Um, and that uh, has been central to the role of the Department of Commerce. Uh, Secretary Gary Locke uh, last year established an internet policy task force, a department-wide task force that draws on the expertise of uh, many of our agencies, uh, the National uh, Telecommunications and Information Administration, the Economics and Statistics Administration, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, and the U.S. Uh, Patent and Trademark uh, Office. Uh, this task force uh, uh, was assigned by Secretary Locke to look at the norms and the ground rules uh, that foster innovation uh, in, in uses of information in four key areas, um, in enhancing internet privacy, uh, in protecting cybersecurity, in promoting intellectual property, uh, and in ensuring uh, the free flow of data uh, across national borders. We recognized as we set out uh, to look at these issues that, that you know, these issues, uh, these difficult issues, needed the input and the cooperation of a diverse range of stakeholders, from businesses to civil society to academia uh, and to consumers, uh, as well as government. And our approach has been to engage uh, all of these groups in the discussion. Uh, it recognizes that uh, a key role for government uh, is in convening stakeholders uh, and leading the way to policy solutions that protect the public interest uh, as well as private innovation. But pure government planning uh, in this space is a prescription uh, for failure. So today's discussion of building a code of conduct uh, around botnet uh, detection, notification, mitigation, focuses on security. But we believe that a similar approach to policy making uh, works across a range of internet issues. Uh, the range of, the full range uh, of issues that uh, uh, we continue to work on uh, at the Department of Commerce. 
uh, central to that work is trust. Uh, the value of trust in this space just cannot be understated. In a world uh, where commerce and trade operate uh, on the exchange of digital information, security and privacy are two sides of the same coin. Uh, and that coin uh, is essential currency uh, in uh, the global economy today. So one important part of uh, commerce's role in building trust on the internet uh, has been uh, the work of the National Institute of uh, Standards and Technology uh, and of uh, NTIA uh, in developing uh, uh, cybersecurity controls. It's been part of NIST's role as a lead agency uh, for uh, civilian government agencies. Uh, its documents, like its special publication, 853, have become leading sources for uh, cybersecurity protections for the private sector as well. Uh, NTIA's role in key internet areas, such as internet governance, uh, uh, remains a key to uh, keeping a trusted infrastructure. So in June, uh, we published at the Department of Commerce our cybersecurity green paper, which focuses on those elements of the non-critical uh, infrastructure uh, in communications. Uh, my colleagues uh, at the Department of uh, Homeland Security, Bruce McConnell and others, focus on the core critical infrastructure that uh, uh, is essential to banking, to healthcare, to core telecommunications. Uh, um, but there is a significant portion of our economy uh, that falls outside this space. So the cybersecurity uh, green paper focuses uh, our efforts on public policies uh, and private sector norms uh, that can improve uh, cybersecurity posture in, of a number of uh, commercial infrastructure operators, uh, software and service providers, uh, uh, and users outside the core critical infrastructure. Uh, it's a realm uh, that we've dubbed the uh, Internet uh, and Information Innovation Sector, uh, or I3 sector. Uh, and it includes uh, uh, important telecommunications functions delivered by small and medium-sized online companies, by retail businesses, uh, uh, that have large online components by information services, uh, including internet and mobile services uh, designed uh, for the consumer level, uh, by social networks uh, and information technology designed to be used by individual consumers, by content providers, and other businesses that, that create uh, and use uh, cyberspace but are not part of the critical infrastructure. So we stress that we want to work with the, the segments uh, of this I3 sector uh, to build security best practices uh, that can become industry codes of conduct uh, that will chart out uh, uh, voluntary uh, standards uh, that can raise uh, the level of security in this sector. So this forum today provides uh, an excellent opportunity to begin the process uh, uh, by working with all stakeholders uh, uh, to build a code around botnet identification, around uh, detection, around mitigation for consumers, uh, and to encourage the incentives for the, the I3 sector companies uh, to implement these codes. Uh, we all know, as Howard uh, described, uh, how botnets uh, increasingly have put consumers uh, at risk. Uh, a botnet infection uh, uh, can lead to uh, the monitoring of a consumer's personal information, to uh, exploitation of uh, computing power uh, and internet access. Um, and, you know, like uh, 
uh, like the woman in uh, Howard's father's neighborhood. Uh, uh, these are threats not just to the individual consumers, uh, but to all of us uh, as these networks uh, are, are used to, uh, to disseminate uh, not only spam, uh, but uh, denial of service uh, attacks uh, and attacks on government and private institutions. So many leading companies like Comcast, like Google, have begun efforts to detect and to notify their customers uh, uh, about uh, infections uh, in ways that uh, avoid uh, invading individuals' privacy. Uh, around the world, other countries have begun to create codes to, to help alert consumers uh, and to encourage these efforts. So we need to begin to define uh, and to create uh, in the United States uh, a vision for similar codes of conduct. Uh, this should be a voluntary effort. It should be stakeholder driven and taking advantage of experience uh, and the expertise of people like you. Uh, this can be a winning proposition in all senses for consumers, uh, for small businesses, for government, for internet service providers, uh, uh, for security companies and e-commerce companies. Uh, we're going to need your help uh, in reaching consensus on a code uh, and you know, reaching consensus on the kinds of collective action uh, that can implement uh, uh, these codes to, to uh, deal with botnet successfully. So we have many avenues for you to participate. Uh, the first of these is the Department of Commerce uh, and Homeland Security uh, request for information uh, uh, published last week. And it will remain open till November 4th. We've, uh, uh, we want your comments. Uh, we've been asked uh, already to host a meeting soon after uh, that RFI process ends. Uh, we're going to work quickly uh, to plan that meeting and to discuss the responses uh, and to develop a path forward. So as the first of what I hope will be many uh, uh, Department of Commerce-led and uh, Department of Homeland Security-led uh, multi-stakeholder initiatives, uh, this is a great opportunity to show that government, uh, industry, and civil society can work together. Uh, collaboratively, without regulation, uh, to keep the internet uh, safer uh, and robust. So I thank uh, CSIS uh, for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, I thank you for being here today. I hope this discussion is just uh, a beginning. And as we move forward uh, tomorrow, I hope you will bring your thoughts uh, and your ideas to this process. Thank you. Hi there, good morning. Uh, my name is Mike O'Reardon and it's a great pleasure for me to be here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies today to talk to you. I'm going to take a couple of minutes of your time to explain what morgue is, because sometimes people hear the pronunciation, they think it's where we keep dead bodies, but it isn't. <laughs> I'm the chairman of morgue, and that's the Messaging Anti-Abuse Working Group, and you can find us at www.morg.org. And I'd like to just take a minute or so to briefly explain why, in my experience, this organization holds a unique position in the global ISP industry. Whilst we were originally founded to combat spam, morgue no longer concerns itself with that struggle. As a group, work has been going on amongst the ISPs at Morgue to deal with the issues of malware and bots for some time now. In fact, we issued guidance to ISPs back in 2009 on this subject. We also focus on emerging technologies such as mobile and social media. Overall, Morgue represents above a about a million mailboxes globally from our ISP, telecom and email service provider members. And we bring together public policy advisors, academic researchers, antivirus vendors, anti-spam vendors, and the legitimate sending community who work very hard to make sure that the mail they do send is wanted and is sent to people that have opted in to receive it. 
It's a global organization with members from Europe, Asia, India, Russia, and we're actively out involved in outreach to China and other countries. And we have working relationships with many of the most respected organ industry organizations, including such things as a formal liaison with the IETF, which I'm proud to say they approached us about. A lot of people try and get liaisons with the IETF, and they generally sort of bounce them, but they came to us and said, we'd like to work with you. Morgue discussions are confidential. You know, to quote the Vegas ad, what happens in morgue stays in morgue, and our membership is vetted. We sponsor invite-only law enforcement meetings, organize sessions on other sensitive topics, provide quite a lot of issue-related training from people who actually know what they're talking about because they're doing these kind of jobs day to day, and publish the only metrics report on abusive email. We have to call it abusive email because being a global organization, there isn't a global definition of spam. And in some countries, spam doesn't exist. There's no legislation against it. In some countries, spam is, I mean, it, you have to call it something other than spam. But those are the only metrics that are um, report on abusive emails aggregated directly from network operators, and the figures there are submitted um, anonymously. Our three-day multi-track meetings in North America and Europe are unprecedented opportunities to stay current on emerging issues whilst meeting a whole bunch of other people who really know what they're talking about, 300 or more security peers from 10 or more countries at any one time. We go to nice places. This month, we're hosting our Paris meeting with the London Action Plan in conjunction with the European Union contact network of spam authorities between the 24th and the 27th of October. It's going to feature a keynote panel of French government cybersecurity officials and amongst the international participants will be representatives from Europe, Canada, Korea, Turkey, the United States and China. If you've got any questions on the meeting or would like any more information about more, please go to our website and we can be contacted through there and we'd be delighted to, to address any questions. Anyhow, now on to the meat of what I've got to talk about, which is the public-private partnership, the ISP role in fighting malware. To start off with, I've got to say, you can't just focus on the ISP. It's a team sport, this, and everybody's got to play their position. And the main players on this team are the service providers, the end users, tools vendors, operating system and application vendors. I'm going to go through what I think are the roles that the various players have. The service provider role is to detect and notify end users of possible infection. End users themselves have to be vigilant and sensible. You know, if someone sends you a note saying you've just come into $27 million if you'll only send them 5,000, it's not true, chaps. You're not gonna get the money. Uh, but they shouldn't have to be their own CSOs. No, they shouldn't have to be their own chief security officers. There's a massive role for education, but it needs to start very young. I mean, it's very cute to see little Johnny navigating his way around the screen, clicking on every pop-up box that sort of presents itself in front of him. But that's actually not what we want to be teaching little Johnny. Little Johnny should know that it's you know, not such a safe place, and the default yes button is not the one to press. Bad habits can start young, and social engineering is a massive problem. Tools vendors need to come up with better tools because the bad guys are outpacing the existing tools. Years ago, AV was a total solution, but now it just forms part of the answer. In the underground economy, where the bad guys get together to buy and sell bots, buy and sell botnets, and buy and sell your credit card details, there's websites out there which allow them to actually test their software that they create. They can put it up against the latest version of vendor A or vendor B and check that it can't be detected and then what they do is they offer guarantees, because if it does get detected, we'll just recompile it, and we'll give you a version that doesn't get detected. Tools vendors also have great information as to the effectiveness of remediation, and they have proved singularly unwilling to share. As for operating system vendors, some really are doing much better than others. The dominant player in this space has got their act together. Five, six years ago, you'd have gone, Crikey, look at them. But now, they've really got their act together and they're doing a fine job. However, one or two of the other vendors aren't. They could be doing a lot better and sometimes they seem to be operating in denial of the problem rather than acceptance of it. Application vendors need to look at security more intensely too. When you look at from the end user perspective and you see pop-up boxes to update application A or update application B, it's just too confusing. 
it's too hard for them. And I think this is one of the reasons that we're seeing more and more, end more, and more uh, malware vulnerabilities now, targeting the applications rather than targeting the operating system, because people don't always keep their, their, their applications up to date, their copies of Java, what have you, because it's too hard, and it's, you're expecting too much of the end users. Now, there's some jolly good work going on. Jolly good, you see, I'm British. I finally said jolly good. I have to say, Com Com Comcast, with its constant guard, is probably a leading example. Um, it's basically a notification and remediation option with a paid notification and self-remediation with a paid option. Much of this, no this um, technology has actually been published on the Comcast website, and the IETF have published an informational RFC, RFC 6108, which actually goes through the system in use that at Comcast. However, I'd say that the, um, the truly inspirational one there is, is CenturyLink. They've been doing this for a long time. Um, they were a Quest, I believe, when they started. And they've been working away at notifying their customers. And they have a very impressive track record. Their approach is much more along the lines with the, they put customers in a walled garden with self-remediation option, and I believe there is some hand-holding. There's also a major US wireless carrier which is starting to notify customers of possible infections. And with the spread of Android and its um, sometimes interesting security model, and we've obviously seen a number of infections on a global basis, particularly in China where there was some substantial Android infections, um, I think it's important that the wireless players start getting in on the game. There are other ISPs in the US who are doing quite a lot of good work. They just don't really talk about it a lot. And there are a number of other ISPs, substantial ones, who have either are in pilot or um, have got plans to sort of start doing this notification. There is work going on at the IETF, and Howard was very kind to <laughs> kindly referred to it. Um, and I have to admit to being one of the authors of an RFC on bot remediation, which is in what's called la which is in what's called last call at the IETF. That means, you know, has anybody got any final objections before we publish this? And I'm hoping that it's got to be published soon. And we'll have to give credit to my colleagues Namal Modi and Jason Livingood at Comcast. In 2009, as I said, Morg issued inform um, guidance to ISPs on what to do about bot remediation, but I believe the IETF document is going to supersede this. However, there's some great global models out there, and I'm going to pick on three. Uh, we've got the voluntary code of practice, where the user basically sorts themselves out, the clean up with assistance model, and the clean up by the end user using centrally provided tools. So I'm going to start off with the Aussies, the Australians, with the I code. This code was launched back in 2010 and it contains four main elements. In order to be I code compliant, you've got to have a notification or management system for compromised computers. There needs to be a standardized information resource for end users a comprehensive resource for ISPs to be able to access the latest threat information, and a reporting mechanism back to, in fact, the CERT in Australia to facilitate a national high-level viewing in case of any major cyber attack. Now in Australia, 30 ISPs so far have signed up for this, which constitutes around about 90% of the Australian ISP market. However, if you look at the I code, there is a key statement in there which I think bears Quoting, ISPs are not required to fix your computer. That's really your responsibility. But the I code encourages them to let you know there may be a problem. So that's the voluntary code version. The next one is the one that's going on in Germany, which is botfry.de, the website. There's an English version of it if you're interested in having a look. And this initiative's been up and running for about a year now. And the way I would sort of categorize this is clean up your computer with assistance. It was initially funded by the federal government in Germany, and it's run by ECHO, which is the German ISP Industry Association. And their target was to take Germany out of the world top 10, as identified by the Semantic Internet Threat Report, for malicious activity and bot infection. And they have a three-stage process, which can be summed up as inform, clean and protect. It differs from the I code as there's a central service to clean up computers and it's a two-stage process. 
Initially, the ISP detects and then passes the customer on to the botfry.de website where there are tools to clean up a machine, and those tools are supplied by industry partners. A failing success there, and we know that with the effectiveness of tools, they will, some people will fail to be successful. They rev the users revert back to the ISP, who issue a ticket to let the customer then dial up the Botfry um, call center, where they get individualized hand-holding to help them clean their machines. In the year it's been running, there's been over a million visitors to the website, 711,000 downloads of cleaning tools, and 315,000 tickets have been issued for customers to get hand-holding and support. There's not a lot of statistics yet out of them, but they are planning on publishing them. One of the important things to bear in mind is that being Germany, they're subject to EU um, pri privacy legislation. So there are very firm rules around what data is and or can be shared. Finally, of course, we come to the Japanese Cyber Clean Center. Now, this has been running since 2006, so I guess we can call this the granddaddy of them. And makes it, it's very interesting because the legal, f um, and really, sorry, this is um, very much a sort of clean up by the end user s system. The legal framework in Japan makes it rather difficult to monitor networks for bot activity and to block access to botnets. So the Japanese Cyber Clean Center focuses on detecting infected PCs and providing tools to clean up those infected PCs and to educate end users. I would encourage you to go and look at the website there is a large part of it in English. There's some very comprehensive diagrams, and you can actually see the flows that they put end users through, how they detect, how they clean up, and the, which industry partners they have available. There's four main parties involved in this. You've got the Japanese government with their Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications and the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry. The Japanese Telecom ISAC, which is their Information Sharing and Analysis Center, and they work with 17, 76 participating Japanese ISPs, which is the majority. You have the Japanese CERT, the Computer, Computer Emergency Response Team, who working together with Trend Micro create the anti-bot tools. And a fourth partner is the Information Technology Promotion Agency out there who brings in other security industry partners. The bots are detected using honeypots. The customers are notified by log analysis. Customer ISP, a customer's ISP then sends email to the infected user as a call to action. The customer visits the CyberClean Center to download the tools and self-remediates. Um, they attribute a decrease in estimated infection of machines from 2.5% in 2006 down to 1% in 2010, partially to the activity of this Japanese CyberClean Center as well as the efforts of the OS vendors to secure their, their software. I'd suggest you go there because there's a very good report, and they've got to the point now where they're starting to actually look at how they notify people and how changes in methods of notification in terms of just wording can up the response rate and get people going to hit those sites. And this is the kind of thing that we're going to have to do because driving people to action is going to be hard. People get bombarded with so many instructions to do this, to do that that there's going to need to be some good work done to work out what are the most effective ways to message and what are the most effective ways to make people feel secure. I know that, for example, with um, some method of notification, people go, well, why are you doing that? It looks like a fish. Or why are you doing that? It looks like a pop-up. I think the position that I take is that you have to start somewhere. If you don't start going down a path, you're never going to get to the end. And being scared to put your foot on the path in the first place isn't going to get you anywhere. So throughout the world, service providers, internet government and technical organizations, quasi-governmental organizations and governments are increasingly adopting approaches to combat bots, malware, DDoS attacks, and other security threats. This reflects an emerging worldwide consensus, a consensus that something needs to be done. But that thing can't be preordained and predefined by any government or regulatory body. No two approaches are the same. I think I've already shown that, you know, just in the US alone. And certainly if you look at it on a global basis, we've seen three different approaches, you know, from three different, you know, geographic areas. Preserving the ability for everyone 
service providers, tools vendors, OS and application vendors, and even the end users in the ecosystem to innovate and create new and better approaches and tools is essential to combat cybersecurity threats more effectively. I thank you for listening to me today, and I'd be happy to take any questions. The speakers uh, do have time for one or two questions, so perhaps we could, uh, why don't we start over there? Early bird gets the worm. Well, from and if you could introduce it's yourself. Like law school, you yeah. get here late, you have to go to the front of the room. Right. Um, I'm church. Steve Ryan, I'm the general counsel of the American Registry of Internet Numbers. And one of the things I just want to say is that Aaron, as a representative of the regional internet registries, is also available for this. We have a lot of experience, every ISP in this room undoubtedly has multiple contracts with us and so one of the policy processes that we have may be of use in this activity so we look forward to working with you on it. Great, thank you. Uh, another one? Is that, uh, we've got one over here. Diane. Thank you, sir. You can use them both if you want. <laughs> Mr. Schmidt, Mr. Carey. Could you tell me what you think the chance of cybersecurity legislation becoming law, say, by next February or March? Well, it's, it's like asking me to know which lottery ticket to buy. Uh, no, but seriously, uh, I think there's a tremendous commitment both on the House and the Senate to move forward on legislation, the bipartisan area. Uh, there have been a number of comments made by the leadership uh, leading the cybersecurity side on, on the House who has said that they are committed to working through this issue. So I have a high level of confidence that something will move forward. Uh, I don't know what the final form will be because that's where, uh, as we've said ever since the outset, that the proposed legislation we move forward on was the beginning of a discussion, not an end point. So we're, we're hoping, looking forward to see it, and I think uh, Congress is very much engaged in, in doing the right thing with this. Uh, if I could just add, yeah, I mean, this is a difficult political environment to, to get things done, but uh, uh, we've seen that uh, there are times that, that you know, we can get bipartisan agreement on legislation. We saw that with patent reform last month. I think uh, we certainly see bipartisan support for cybersecurity legislation. Uh, this is complicated stuff, so it's, you know, there are a lot of, uh, lot of pieces that need to converge, uh, but I, I think there are a lot of committees uh, that uh, they're at work on this, uh, uh, focused on it. Uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee is uh, reporting out uh, its data security bill, so uh, I think we will, there's a good chance we will see, you know, some significant components of this pass in, in this Congress. Well, let me uh, ask you to join me in thanking uh, Howard Schmidt, the uh, cybersecurity coordinator for the Obama administration, Cameron Kelly, general counsel at the Department of Commerce, and Michael O'Reardon, chairman, chairman of the morgue, uh, for <laughs> these remarks they've made. What I'm going to do now is let's applaud them, please. Ask the uh, panelists to now come up. Let me grab Great. So to do quick introductions, and again, we have bios for people out at the entry desk. Uh, Jamie Barnett, Chief of the uh, Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau at FCC. Uh, really grateful he could make it today. Uh, known him for a long time. Uh, Bruce McConnell, Department of Homeland Security, 
my uh, staff yesterday asked me, they said, who's Bruce McConnell? Can we, we can't find his bio anywhere. So I said, well, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> I've known Bruce, uh, I've known, known Bruce quite a while. Uh, what is your title? Oh, Counselor to the Deputy Undersecretary for National Protection and Programs Director at U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Really someone who's been doing this for quite a long time. Um, oh, Max Weinstein, President and Executive Director of Stop Badware. We're really grateful for Max for coming in. Ari Schwartz, who most of you know now at NIST. Uh, long and distinguished career in uh, these issues, internet issues. And finally, Kate Dean. Kate, we're very grateful for you to appear here today, Executive Director of the U.S. Internet Service Provider Association. So what I'm going to ask to do is we'll just go right down the row. I'll ask each of the panelists to maybe talk for uh, five minutes. We'll start with Jamie. We'll end with Kate. And then we'll open the floor to questions or comments uh, from you. So, Jamie, please. Do you prefer or? It's your choice. All right. Well, if, uh, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll sit. So, good morning. Um, I especially want to thank Jim and, and the staff at the Center for um, uh, uh, Strategic International Studies uh, for this Im important dialogue uh, and really to be able to serve with these distinguished panelists and get to hear our keynote speakers. I really think that the title of this program is fascinating. Uh, it's a, a public-private partnership uh, and the ISP role, which would of course be one of the private uh, parts of the partnership, and that partnership uh, I indeed uh, needs to take a, a holistic approach uh, and a collective coordinated action among uh, both government entities and uh, private companies. So I'm here to talk about the FCC's uh, role in that partnership. And I would, I would call that a, a, a role that is a supporting role uh, when you compare it to the leadership roles that the Department of Commerce, the Department of Homeland Security must play. Uh, but it's still an important and perhaps essential supporting role in helping us secure the nation's cyber ecosystem against malware threats. Uh, and uh, the point is that all hands must be on deck uh, for this uh, partnership to work, and we can't really afford uh, for any part to be idle. Uh, the FCC has always been vitally interested in uh, the security and reliability of communication networks. The Internet has expanded the concept and scope of communications, uh, but the very openness of the Internet makes it very vulnerable to exploits and exploitation, and the specific areas of risk exist in the Internet uh, routing and directory services. So now the guy in your, your uh, uh, office next to you, your mom's computer, uh, e uh, Howard's dad, uh, even your computer are all uh, exposed to torrents of, uh, of malware and, and spam and make them susceptible to, to infection and setting them up as threats uh, to other users, uh, but uh, perhaps in extreme scenarios to the communications infrastructure itself. So millions of computers uh, get incorporated into botnets each month capable of launching uh, crippling distributed denial of service attacks. Uh, just last week, one of Australia's key interno, uh, internet registries, net registry, reported a major denial of service attack. Uh, it uh, left customers unable to access their websites for one or more days. So like uh, legacy communication networks, we must remember the internet is operated uh, by private commercial entities, not the government. And so the legacy, like uh, legacy communications, private companies are the vanguard uh, for protecting their infrastructure and their, con and their consumers. Uh, ISPs are, are not alone in this responsibility, uh, but they play a significant function in battling botnets and malware. Uh, and naturally, ISPs would be concerned about their responsibilities in remediating botnets. And, re and really, in a lot of ways, they're pulled in a lot of different directions. I think that ISPs are concerned about unnecessary, the possibility of unnecessary government uh, intervention or regulation. Uh, they're concerned, concerns about uh, customer privacy rights, uh, fear of losing commercial advantage, fear of exposure uh, to new legal liabilities uh, have caused uh, trepidation uh, for ISPs uh, that are seeking to uh, create safer online experiences for their customers. Uh, but the industry also lacks an effective common set of guidelines for what should be done to detect, uh, notify, remediate end users' computers uh, that have become uh, infected uh, uh, by bots and other forms of mal malware. So speaking for myself, I think that a proper role, uh, government role, uh, should start with facilitating collective action among the public uh, sector and private entities using the least restrictive, uh, least regulatory means available that actually achieve success. And I think I can speak uh, in harmony with my other federal partners 
uh, that when I say that we in the public uh, government sector realize it will take a cooperative, uh, focused public-private partnership in order to effectively uh, combat the malware that threatens Internet users uh, and networks. Uh, and uh, Ken mentioned the, the Commerce uh, Department, so the Green Paper. It suggests that voluntary codes of conduct are really a written set of industry-wide voluntary practices designed to spur a community to operate in a uniform manner. It should be developed through a multi-stakeholder process um, to significantly advance efforts to protect the Internet. Um, so the, the, uh, the U.S. Department of Commerce and the, the Homeland Security's RFI uh, which uh, was uh, built on this. I guess that came out uh, just uh, really yeah, two, two weeks ago. Um, works on, uh, builds on past work here and abroad to ask those important questions uh, about creating that voluntary uh, code to address the def uh, detection, notification, and mitigation of botnets. I think it's a major step forward, and we at the Commission fully support uh, federal partners in, in uh, going through this method to combat uh, this growing threat. Uh, we're really especially interested to uh, hear the responses to the RFIs, questions on practices to help prevent uh, and mitigate botnet infections, practices for identifying them, uh, the effectiveness of uh, consumer notification and, and incentives, which I think are very important, to promote uh, voluntary action to notify consumers. Uh, these questions and the responses are extremely important as we formulate uh, that strategy. And uh, as has been previously alluded to, this is not just a U.S. problem. There, the solutions are global, and so we uh, definitely are, are interested in looking at uh, the, uh, the I code, the things that have been done in Germany and, and Japan. Uh, steps to remediate the adverse effect of botnets uh, do involve more than the ISP community, but the ISP surely have a significant role to play. At the Commission, we're doing uh, our part to assist our federal partners and in the industry in combating uh, global botnet threats. Um, and here's what the Commission is doing. In December of 2010, the FCC's Communication, Security, Reliability, and Interoperability Council, or CISRIC, Working Group 8, released a report uh, recommending 24 voluntary best practices to address botnet uh, protections for consumer and network providers. Some of you in this room, I think, served on that, and I appreciate that. Best practices covered several areas, including prevention, detection, notification, mitigation, and identified means to address externalities uh, such as privacy concerns. And then on 20, uh, September 23rd of this year, we had the inaugural meeting of the newly rechartered CISRIC 3, uh, and that was Working Group 7. I uh, appreciate Ari Schwartz of the Department of Commerce. Uh, my fellow panelists here coming to address the entire uh, CISRIC group as we kicked it off. That includes some 60 experts from industry and government. Michael O'Riordan is on it. Um, uh, we have Steve Crocker, Rodney Joffe. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Max is serving on one of our working groups. It's an Al uh, Alan Powler. There are others of you that are serving on this. It's an all-star cast. And really, over the next 18 months, the new CISRIC 3 uh, will be reviewing efforts undertaken within the international community, and among domestic stakeholder groups, uh, such as the uh, Australian Internet Industry Code of Practice, a uh, relative, uh, irrelevant uh, 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 IETF uh, request for comment, the MOG uh, or MORG, however you want to pronounce it, um, uh, for applicability uh, to our, our domestic uh, ISPs. And then building on the work of the CISRIC 2 Working Group 8, and in coordination with DHS uh, and the Department of Commerce, and really informed uh, by their uh, RF. RFI, uh, the, the working group three, a uh, working group seven of CISRIC three will propose uh, a set of agreed upon voluntary practices and a, and a framework for ISP uh, implementation. So we want to work very closely with our federal partners on this, and, and the working group will also identify potential ISP uh, implementation obstacles uh, and identify steps that the FCC and, and other uh, federal partners uh, can take to help overcome those, those obstacles. We realize this is not, this is not easy. Uh, and then finally, the, uh, the working group will identify outcome-oriented performance metrics to evaluate the effectiveness of their work in addressing uh, the botnet problem. So uh, in all of this, we want to work very closely with industry and, and um, our federal partners. Uh, we're committed to, to do so uh, through the CISRIC, and, and we want to identify those, those ways that we can leverage lessons learned globally to create the right environment. Uh, and so, Jim, thank you again for the opportunity to come and speak uh, to this group. I look forward to our continued discussion. Thanks very much. Uh, Bruce. Thanks, Jim. Uh, let me also say what a pleasure it is to be here, and I love it when a plan comes together so we really have a public 
private partnership uh, in action uh, today, in, and uh, we have the government acting in concert, so um, that's all, all positive. It's been a great morning already. I've learned two new words, uh, mog uh, <coughs> and uh, shambolic. Uh, which I thought, uh, there is a Three Dog Night song about yeah. that, right? That's right. So uh, I thought perhaps we were talking about the myst mythical kingdom in Tibetan Buddhism, but apparently it's about something else. So uh, so that's been good. Uh, today is uh, the um, you know, third or fourth day of National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, so what more appropriate topic to be uh, talking about, because this is all about um, and notifying and making people more aware of what is happening and what their piece of the action is in terms of uh, fixing things. Um, it's part of a larger vision that uh, we at DHS have, uh, and later in the month we'll be releasing our uh, blueprint, our, our strategy for the Homeland Security Enterprise that focuses on uh, a couple of different things. Uh, one is uh, protecting critical information infrastructure today, and secondly, to uh, promote uh, the creation of a healthier cyber ecosystem for tomorrow. And this work we're talking about today fits into both of those uh, focus areas because botnets truly are a scourge. Uh, and from the standpoint of the damage they do, but also the fact that they uh, create a lot of noise uh, on the internet and um, can be the ve uh, vectors of serious threats or can hide other threats that and make them harder to find. So we're, we're all for, for uh, reducing them. And, uh, but like so many other aspects of Homeland Security, uh, cybersecurity is a shared responsibility. And so that's what we're talking about today. Uh, let's see if we can figure out the best roles and responsibilities for attacking this particular problem. Uh, in a way that minimizes the government role and makes sure that it is doing the parts that only it can do uh, and that everyone else is doing the parts that they can do the best uh, and we're working together on this. So in this case, uh, we've seen uh, the government now taking a facilitative role in part to cause this conversation to occur and also uh, it is um, in an extension of our role as uh, educators and in fact, um, as uh, in, in terms of Homeland Security, this uh, particular effort that we've been par uh, working on with Commerce and with the FCC and the White House um, has been a focus primarily on our educational uh, role rather than our protect and prevent role, although it will have a good effect on that, we hope, uh, because uh, we are uh, key, one of our key uh, approaches is to make sure that everybody is doing what they need to be doing. Um, so we have a lot of things going on. We obviously are the sponsors of the National Cybersecurity Awareness Month uh, with our uh, partners at uh, the National Cybersecurity Alliance and with all of you. Uh, and in addition, we, uh, we have our awareness campaign, which uh, <coughs> Howard mentioned, the Stop, Think, Connect campaign, which is now uh, uh, really getting uh, some legs. We're now partnered with the Girls and Boys Clubs, with the Y. Uh, MCA, YWCA, we're working with the Scouts. So uh, this is uh, really getting out there with the young people who need to understand their part in uh, securing uh, the future and uh, present internet. So we're looking forward very much to the uh, responses uh, from, the RS, uh, from the RFI and see uh, what we can learn about the ways in which the private sector can help participate in educating consumers about botnets and malware. Um, and uh, to the and understanding even further uh, to what extent that can actually reduce the uh, prevalence and impact of this uh, scourge on the uh, internet and on all of us. So, uh, is it, will education uh, work? Is this something that uh, people want to do? And uh, if they do do it, will it have an effect? Are the questions that we're really interested in in finding out. There's a broader uh, impact as well. Uh, will this help improve computer literacy and computer security literacy in general among uh, users? And we think that that uh, will, and that's consistent with where we're trying to go in our overall uh, educational uh, mission. So I, too, look forward to the discussion, and I will get out of the way of our uh, further distinguished panelists so we can get that going. Thanks. Um, thank you, Bruce. Uh, Max, uh, please. Thanks, Jim. Um, right. So. Stop Badware, as an organization over the last few years, has been working in something of a parallel area, addressing a different area of cybercrime, which is uh, what we refer to as badware websites. These are the websites uh, from which people get infected with bots, uh, bot malware and other forms of malware. The 
websites that uh, tell you your computer is infected with 237 infections and if you just pay $79 uh, on your credit card, they'll uh, clean it up for you and so on. Um, and so as I was uh, thinking about this topic, I was thinking as we, as we speak about what do we need to do, how are we going to do it, who's going to do it, uh, I was thinking from the perspective of our experience, what do the consumers actually need? Um, what, you know, what from our experience in working with probably tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands at this point of website owners whose sites have been compromised um, by malicious activity, what, what do they need in order to, um, to help themselves uh, address this issue from a remediation standpoint? Uh, the first one, of course, it's been talked about a lot is notification. Uh, a lot of people, like uh, Howard's mother or father, rather, don't uh, don't know that their computers are infected. Malware has gotten much trickier over the years. It uh, isn't like a few years ago where you'd be getting pop-ups all over your screen, and boy, did you know you had adware or spyware or malware on your computer in some of those cases. Nowadays, it can be very stealthy, not even slowing down your computer to a crawl, but really having no discernible. Uh, impact that can be uh, easily detected. So notification is, is key. Um, the second piece is understanding. In our experience, when webmasters find out their sites have been compromised, and they often find this out uh, when suddenly Google is putting up a big warning saying, uh, don't visit this website, it's infected. Um, People almost go through the stages of grief. You know, there's an aspect of denial. No, that's not possible. It can't be my site. And then they get angry, uh, often at Google, sometimes at us, uh, anyone who's giving them the message that their site is, uh, is infected. Um, bargaining, uh, right? Uh, you know, and, and, and finally, acceptance. And, um, and, and so there really is a, a key here that with notification, really comes a necessity to educate people about what does this mean? How is it possible that my computer could be infected and I'm not seeing any ill effects of it and I have antivirus on my computer? How, you know, how could I possibly have an infected computer? Um, the third piece of it is what we're expecting people to do. Um, and I differentiate this from how to go about doing it. I'm just talking about what they're supposed to do. Um, you can imagine it's not uncommon nowadays for people to have multiple devices on their home network. Um, you know, they might have wireless, they might have an iPad, they might have a couple different laptops in the home, maybe a voice over IP telephone, things like that. And when someone gets a message saying, some device on your network has malware on it, well, what am I supposed to do now? Um, and so we need to kind of spell out for them. You need to figure out which device or devices are infected. You need to get them cleaned up and you need to get them protected because otherwise they're just going to become infected again. Um, and so we need to really sort of spell out what the expectation is for people. The fourth piece, of course, is how do you go about doing that? And that's providing the information, the tools, um, the services necessary so that people uh, can help themselves and get their devices cleaned up. And Finally, for some people, and it's not going to be for everyone, but for many people, there's also, they're going to actually need help doing those things. So there's how to do it in terms of here's a set of instructions, here's some tools. Um, but I can tell you that if I went to Home Depot, I could buy a book telling me how to build a wall, and I could buy the lumber and the nails and the hammers and everything else, and I would get home and I would not be able to build that wall. Because I can do with computers a lot of things, and there's a lot of things with a hammer that I can't do well at all. Um, and so we, some people are really going to need that third party assistance. Whether that third party ends up being the ISP, a national level resource like uh, exists in Germany, um, or some other solution, we need to make sure people have that option. Beyond that, I, th I think that it's really important when you think about this from a consumer uh, perspective to say there really needs to be this full range of options. Um, some people really want the help and they, they're willing to pay for it and they have the money to pay for it and they're, they're perfectly happy to say, here, here's my laptop, please get the malware off of it, I don't want to deal with this anymore. There's plenty of people that uh, don't have the money. Uh, to do that. I mean, we're talking right now about a national level initiative. We're talking about people who 
you know, barely can afford to have internet access and, you know, you're going to be in a situation where they may not be able to spend $129 to pay someone to help with the malware. And then there's people who like to do things themselves and there's some people who are willing to try it themselves for an hour and if they can't solve it, then they're willing to pay for someone. And so we really need to make sure that whatever solution we come up with, whether it looks like the Australian model, the German model, the Japanese model, or most likely some hybrid that uh, borrows from some of the best of uh, what's out there and perhaps puts our own unique American spin on it, um, that it has that full range of options that consumers are looking for and that they really need. Um, and and I, I say this not only because uh, we want to make consumers happy, but also because we need consumers to clean up their devices. This is something, botnets are a problem that affects everybody. Um, you know, Bruce and, and, and Jamie both talked about this. Um, this is a problem where we want people to clean up their devices. And if we want people to clean up their devices, we have to make sure that we're making it as easy as possible for them to do that in the way that works best for them and meets their needs. So uh, that's what I have to say to start, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, um, not just for hosting this event, but also for bringing together this great audience, actually. I mean, I'm really impressed by the people that are in this room. I would. I kind of feel like I should turn my uh, microphone around and get to everyone's opinion on this topic, but uh, that's why we have a request for information. So I'll just uh, put it out there that I, I hope that everyone in this room that has shown this level of interest and is you know this, the caliber of people in this room will uh, will uh, respond to our uh, request for information that's out there uh, until November fourth. Um, with that, let me just highlight four things that are been that are important to the commerce uh, department. I mean, the, the RFI asks a lot of questions, but it doesn't go into kind of a lot of detail about what our vision is in this space. But I do think some things are highlighted in there that give you an idea, and I'll, and I'll point to um, four the four major themes that I think are very important to the commerce department in this space. Um, first of all, that whatever comes out of moving forward is uh, in the, in this space is voluntary and is a public private uh, par true public private private partnership. I think you've heard a lot of that from uh, Cam Carey's discussion of multi-stakeholder uh, discussions. But I also like to point out that this is really the, the, a big opportunity to prove that um, uh, multi-stakeholder effort like that can work. We have some efforts that have been successful in the security space. I don't think we point to them enough, actually. Um, Mog, Mog's work on spam is a good example. Michael's already spoken to that to some, some degree. I mean, the, the best practices that have come out of, the, out of Mog and the sh information sharing that have come out of Mog have helped to stem the tide against spam and have been successful. Um, the anti-phishing working group has been extremely successful in bulk phishing, in, in uh, um, stemming uh, bulk phishing attacks. Uh, and now we have to work on spear phishing a little more, but uh, on, on the bulk phishing side, I think we have seen major improvements. Um, and the anti-spyware coalition that I helped work on when I was in the private sector um, really helped to uh, end nuisance and harmful adware that was supported by major uh, firms and, and uh, venture capital money. So um, we have seen successes in this space in the past. This is really taking it up one step, um, and in order to build um, a voluntary effort in this space. Um, we're going to need uh, greater effort and code of conduct um, in, in this space to uh, to 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 uh, take things to the next level. Uh, number two uh, is something that Michael Reardon talked about, um, which I've called uh, that that the which I've kind of phrased as that the incentives uh, in this space must maximize the potential of the security mar the, the existing security market to address the problem. Um, he said very eloquently that um, we have a lot of tools in this existing security market. We ha some have some cases we have kept up, some cases we haven't, um, and we have to figure out how to maximize the work that's being done in that space. We're spending a lot of money. There is an existing marketplace. We have to have that work if this effort is going to be successful. Um, number three, that benefits for uh, there must be benefit for all companies involved, and I take that beyond the ISPs. There's been a lot of talk about the ISPs, but we also know other companies um, have notified in this space, and other companies like the securities companies and others um, have been in, are going to be important players if this is going to be successful. I also think it's important that the, those benefits um, must uh, must uh, be for small companies as well as large companies, and we need to figure out ways to get incentives to work for them, and those be the benefits must outweigh, uh, outweigh costs for large companies and small companies alike. Um, uh, and lastly, um, that 
what we come up with must actually end up protecting the consumer. And by that I mean that we have to give the consumers information and a means to fix the problem, both Max and um, Michael spoke about that. We also have to be able to protect privacy because we're not uh, doing it to the consumers any good if we're uh, invading their privacy and uh, helping their security. We can do both at the same time and consumers expect um, us to do both at the same time. And uh, third, uh, that we have due process in the notices that we give and the efforts that we take. Um, th that sounds like we're asking a lot from this process, but the good news is we already know that companies have done this, right? We have Comcast and Google and other efforts out there that have formed best practices. CISRIC, the, the FCC work that uh, uh, um, Admiral Barnett's uh, group has done has been, uh, has really helped to define best practices in this space. We have the IETF standards um, that do all of these things. Um, we can do it and um, we have to make sure that incentives get more companies involved and more individuals covered in this space. Thank you, Ari. I promised Kate the last word, so I'm glad it worked out in the seating arrangement. Absolutely, thank you. Um, I want to say thank you to Ari and to Jim and to CSIS for inviting me to participate in the discussion today. It's, uh, it's rare that I get to spend my mornings with such a gust uh, company. Um, and before I even get started, I, I want to uh, tell everyone that um, I undertook a real investigation of our members and talked to a number of people in, in just the general area about this idea of um, botnet mitigation when we started talking to Ari about the RFI. And I, I just want to let everyone know that the companies are taking very seriously the government's interest in this space and um, that I think you'll see that many providers and associations will be responding to the RFI. So we'll have a little bit more to say uh, a month from now when the comments go in. I guess I should tell you a little bit about uh, US ISPA. We're an organization that is member driven and we were founded in January of 2002. Um, we focus on really a discrete set of policy and uh, legal concerns that are common to the internet service providers, network providers, and portal providers. Uh, we primarily work in the areas of law enforcement compliance and security, which would include cybersecurity. Getting to uh, why, why we're here today, um, the title of today's event questions what the role of the ISP is or should be in combating cyber threats. And I, I, we've heard a lot from others today about what that role could be. And we've heard um, you know, about efforts that are underway both here and abroad. And I think that we would recognize that the ISP does have an important role to play but it, it really is but a role in the entire ecosystem of participants. Um, in, in preparing for today, I talked to a number of people and I think you'll see with the range of you know, responses to the RFI, it's very similar to my membership. It's diverse and everybody is going to come at it from their own experience and uh, you know, for the needs uh, based on their own architecture and products that they provide. Um, but there were some common threads in the responses that I got from people, so I wanted to highlight a couple of things here today. First of all, I think it's very important to acknowledge that ISPs are already on the forefront of cybersecurity. They are the leaders in this space, they are committed to cybersecurity, and they have been providing for a very long time security solutions both across networks and directly to the end user consumer. They do this both for their own self-interest, to protect their own networks, and to provide greater security solutions for their customers. Um, you know, I, I have so many examples of, of different services that are available by all different levels and sizes and kinds of providers. Um, there are customized services available, there are premium services available, there are services that are baked into the service itself, there are wall garden options, there are uh, like direct assistance options where the company can directly work with the customer if they have a security problem. The, to quote someone uh, who I talked to the other day, the networks and the, the services are literally pregnant with security solutions today. Um, we are vigilant against all varieties of threats um, and you know this is evident in the fact that the the networks are robust and they're very sophisticated and all of you are you know typing on your laptops right now and you know pinging back and forth on your iPhones 
Um, the second point that I'd like to address today is one that Mike really talked about um, very clearly earlier and one that I've already highlighted, and that is this discussion is an important discussion. And um, I think it's great that the government has initiated a, a conversation about what the different roles are in this space. But it's not so great if we're only looking at one sector of the entire internet industry and asking you know, the ISPs to create the solutions to this problem. So the, one of the things that the government could do would be to broaden the ecosystem of people who are sitting around the table. And I think that, that you know, we've heard from many before me today, and I think that's their intention. And hopefully, um, you know, the antivirus companies and the tool vendors will be responding to um, the RFI as well. Uh, the third point I'd like to make really goes to the flexibility points that you've already heard earlier today. Um, you know, architectures are very different. Uh, each service provider, believe me, is very unique. They have their their own concerns. These systems have been, you know, built up over the past number of decades. The technology varies from product to product, and certainly from company to company. So. Whatever, whatever it is that comes out of the idea of you know, pre creating more security and fighting botnets must be one that the ISP can, can create on their own and can implement across their own network without it being a top-down approach. The government needs the companies to remain innovative in this space. They need to be able to stay ahead of the threats. Um, and any kind of uniform response is only going to um, handcuff us from being able to quickly respond to, you know, these dynamic threat environments. Um, and lastly, I think, I think some have mentioned it, and I would really like to make sure that we have a full discussion about this going forward. But it really is, you know, we've talked about what the role of the ISP, who should be involved in this, but there really is a question out there, which is what is the role of the government? What role should the government be playing? And I think we recognize that there is a role for the government, but that role may be limited. Um, some of the crucial areas where we see government involvement as necessary and, and important, um, definitely in the area of, of user education and awareness like we've heard today, the government is uniquely situated to reach every household in the country and it, will, it is important that the government be um, supported in this role. Um, the other, another area where we see the government is effective is doing what we're doing today. They started the conversation. They have the ability to bring people together to, you know, further talk about this topic. Um, and I, I'm just going to say it because I bring it up, you know, over and over again in meetings, so I might as well do it again. But one of the areas where we would like to see some movement from the government is to provide some leadership and some clarity on some of the outstanding legal issues that um, create some uncertainty. I heard from everyone I spoke to leading up to this particularly when you talk directly to the security guys, they have security solutions that they want to bring to market. Um, but some of the legal uncertainty can really slow the adoption and the implementation of that. So any leadership that the government can provide in that area would be very welcome. I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so this is your big chance. You've been waiting patiently. Uh, can I ask if there are any questions from the floor? Uh, go ahead, please. And um, my name is Eric Fisher. I'm with the Library of Congress. And sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, go ahead, Eric. But Eric, just one short thing on this. So one of the things that we're looking at with the CISRIC 3 are some type of performance metrics. So it's good to have best practices, it's good to have a code of conduct, but you're exactly right. And I think it was Michael or someone that, that mentioned performance metrics. I think you have to have those to kind of see, measure how we're going. Uh, and I know there are other efforts that are, are very interested in that as well.
Yeah, and I'll add to that as, as well that um, it, it can be very difficult to measure if you're looking at total populations. Um, because when, when you look at the population and you, you know, in Japan, you say, okay, that the national level is from two, you know, 2.4% to 1%. Well, that's great. Um, you certainly can't attribute that entirely to any one, uh, one cause. Um, it, it can be very difficult to, uh, to look at cause and effect. What you can do is look at correlations and, and, and hope that you're getting somewhere close uh, to understanding the cause. Um, and I think that as we think about it, you also want to think about it in terms of uh, almost like in, in medicine of treating patients. Uh, it's great if you can reduce the overall disease populations. It's also great if you can treat a certain number of patients regardless of whether the overall disease population has been improved or not. In other words, um, you know, if you save 100 people from a disease from dying, You've saved 100 people from, <laughs> from dying. This is a good thing. Um, and, and so I think as we, as we think about metrics, we need to think about how we measure the overall problem. But we also need to think about how many people have we helped and how many people have we served uh, directly through whatever efforts uh, we're doing. Because that alone is an important measurement. Let me just raise that we, we asked this question in the RFI specifically because we think that it's extremely important. Um, and we, uh, we think that it's, uh, um, we, we need to come up with some measures moving forward and figure out what they are. It's, it's certainly important to NIST where I'm employed, uh, which is based on measurement. The work we do is based on measurements. But, um, the, uh, but I, I do want to point out also that there's no single solution uh, to a problem like this, right? I mean, I, did, I credited MOG with uh, helping to solve the spam problem, right? But there's a lot of things that went into to making it so that consumers now today receive less spam than they did five years ago, right? There's a lot of reasons that that happened. The work that MOG did certainly is part of that, right? But it alone is not the piece. Law enforcement played a role. Techn technological improvements played a big role, right? We have a lot of different things that went into effect um, that um, helped to, to, to solve the problem. Um, but the, you know, the public-private partnership piece of it and the, the multi-stakeholder piece of it play, has played a role in several areas. Um, and the question is, what can we do in this space um, as part of it? We're still going to need the other pieces as well. The um, metrics thing is, I think, one of the big changes we've seen in thinking about cybersecurity in the last few years, particularly if you can measure outcomes. So the more we can do this, the better we'll be able to identify things that are working. So uh, that's going to be one of the challenges over the next couple of years. And it's, you know, where to start. It's hard to identify metrics, but I think we're getting there. Uh, more questions? Uh, go ahead. Uh, Lynn Matthijs with the National Economic Security Grid. From an economic standpoint, um, I don't think we've really, from a metric standpoint, established what this real impact of these kinds of attacks on our computer systems are. You know, we had a defining event with 9-11 and with Pearl Harbor when we were attacked, and yet today, if you look at the thousands of terabytes of attacks and losses that we're having, it just seems to, you know, fall off the, the side of the, the mountain and nobody seems to really crystallize these issues. Why is it that we have these issues taking place and it seems to go back to the individuals who created the software systems and the hardware systems that these are operating on and yet they have no liability responsibility? You take a look at what's happened over the years with things that impact the population with airplanes. We created the FAA and put regulations over them and they now have to have standards that they operate against. We did the same thing with automobiles. We did the same thing with food and pharmaceuticals. And yet we've got the most significant economic impact on our country and on the world taking place over the internet and on our computer systems. And we can't seem to get a coordinated approach on it to fight back against the 140 countries that our own government says they know are actively and aggressively stealing technology from our own country. Uh, it doesn't seem to make sense to me that we can't seem to get a coordinated approach to this, and I'd be interested in your response. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, Bruce can take up, take up on this as well, but I, I, I think that, you know, from, from our point of view, those of us that worked on legislative package um, was to address 
this issue, right? I mean, it is to come up with the authorities that need to be put in place to get a more coordinated response, to give DHS the authority to, um, uh, to better coordinate for the critical infrastructure. Um, of course, of course it, it is, but we believe that that work that will come out of there, especially the idea of building frameworks in these spaces, and, uh, and will help to provide better clarity and better uh, liability apportioning in the marketplace, right? And then we can build, we will have a better liability structure than we do today, right? Mm -hmm. Similarly, in the non-critical infrastructure space, we've we're trying to do this work to spell out in this, the internet in information innovation sector, how we go about um, building up voluntary efforts that we know have worked in the past in certain areas, taking them to the next level, right? And addressing these concerns um, in, with using codes of conduct that we know have worked in, other, in certain areas, to bring, making that, make, getting that to work in a, in a way better than uh, has worked in the past that will also clarify liability down the road. The problem that we have today is that um, uh, it, it's hard for an insurance marketplace to work where when you don't have liability um, uh, figured, the liability rules figured out and the government shouldn't pick the winners and losers in the marketplace by figuring out, by, by appointing liability. We need to take, we need to, to build the authority to create, to move the marketplace where the marketplace can figure out who, where, the, where the liability should fall. And then we can, then the, the market mechanisms can kick in um, and the government efforts can kick in at that point. So I don't know if so, so I would just uh, echo both of your comments because I think uh, we are at, I mean, it always baffles me. Um, we always say, you know, what, well, when a really bad attack happens then, it's like what could be worse than what we're seeing now, right? Except we're not seeing it. So we, unlike Pearl Harbor or 9-11 uh, where there was uh, video, Right? There's no video for this. So humans don't respond to the fact that the, this uh, almost invisible uh, at the moment uh, crime that is being committed. And so uh, we really do, though, need to uh, develop a national consensus around this and move forward. So uh, as Ari suggests, you know, the administration did uh, present some legislation, some proposals to the Hill. Uh, we say they're not the uh, be all and end all. They're not all the answers, but um, we think they go uh, part of the way there, and we are, you know, encouraging everyone to get involved in that process, and and let's come up with something uh, in this Congress that moves the ball, you know, if not all the way to the goal line, at least uh, down the field in this area. Because if we just, uh, this is a clear case where the perfect is an enemy of the good. Just two quick things. Your your sense of urgency is spot on. You're absolutely correct on that. And the second thing is I think we, we do have to look, as I mentioned earlier, we have to have all hands on deck on this. We have to look at every organ of government. We have to look at every way of, of incorporating uh, that, that public-private partnership. Uh, we can't afford to leave any, any stone unturned on that, but it has to be now. Uh, Alan. Yeah, Alan Powell from the Sands Institute. <clears throat> Alan from the Sands Institute, mainly for Ari and Bruce, if he wants to, I'm completely confused about the Commerce CAMS sort of initial statement that whatever we do is voluntary. I, I don't mind voluntary, I love voluntary, but why didn't we use voluntary for airplane safety? Why didn't we use voluntary for smoking? Why didn't we use voluntary for environmental safety? Why, I mean, if voluntary is so perfect, why don't we have dozens of examples? What, and this one isn't a new problem. Cam sounded like he had just discovered it. This is a decade ago, people were barraging ISPs with your, your guys are infecting me, can you stop them? And they completely ignored it. So if there's ever a failure of the market to, to respond, we got one here. So I'm just, I'm lost on this. Obviously it's a, it's a, a voluntary solution. Well, uh, the, the, I think you I want to separate out the critical infrastructure, what, what, what we considered in the, in the um, Obama administration proposal to the Hill. Um, from the covered critical infrastructure from the non-covered critical infrastructure. And a lot of that gets spelled out down the road, right? So we need to make that determination. But the covered critical infrastructure space, we believe, is not voluntary. It is the, the, the industry has, to, has the first shot at coming up with its framework at which security plans are based, but those security plans are required. And the, uh, the, the so, we, we do have, um, and, and, the, and the, the, um, 
the, the, that will set the, the goal for, this, for those uh, critical infrastructure companies. For the non-critical infrastructure space, right, and right, it's determined what that is in the future, um, we've set up kind of this area that we think is uh, important to say is non-covered critical infrastructure, which is the internet and innovation, uh, internet and information innovation sector, and spell it out in our green paper. In that space, we say that it should be voluntary, and that's where Cam is focusing his discussion, right? And he, he specifically did say that he was focusing on the, the I3 sector um, in, in as, a, as a place, start, as the starting point. Um, we know that efforts there have worked. We also know that DHS has limited resources, right? That is not going to be the first, if, even if you consider that some of this, these things critical infrastructure, it's not going to be the first space that you work um, in, in, in here if you have, list when you list out the critical infrastructure. We need to start working today, and we can do it without legislation to build voluntary efforts today, right? So we want to spell this out, say that we think that companies in this space can do it voluntarily. There has been a history of that, right, and move them towards better efforts in this past so we get the dozens of efforts so that when we get to the point of DHS deciding what is critical and non-critical, we have the dozens of efforts that can show that voluntary effort works. Does that, does that make a little more sense? I, I just note that what I, first I'd note I didn't pay Alan to say that. And the second thing is that one way to think about this is this is a new effort. It's a voluntary effort. Try the voluntary approach for a while, a year or two, and if it isn't working, then you have to think about something else. But, you know, this has worked in other countries, and maybe I'll take the moderator's prerogative and ask each of the panelists, when you think of the German or the Australian experience in particular, um, what are the parts you like, what are the parts you don't like? And maybe you can just... That's a big question. Uh, so, it is a big question. So, and so actually, I do like the voluntary uh, part. Um, and, and going to, to Alan's question, too, and I agree with, with Ari on this, I, I do think we have to use the least restrictive means. We have to go a voluntary method. I think there's a lot more focus on it right now. But it goes to Eric's question, too. I do think we have to measure it. Uh, and during that two-year period that, that Jim mentioned, uh, we have to see how it goes. Uh, and, and then, you know, if it's not working, then, then palpably we, have to, we might have to do something else. Uh, but we do have a track record elsewhere, Germany, Japan, uh, Australia, uh, and I think that, uh, that we should measure it to see how we do it. So I guess I'd say what I like about those efforts is that they are in place. So that's better than we're doing here. So we, that's a good thing. Uh, I think the question that, you know, the underlying debate about this, because, you know, in our country we, we always have this debate, and especially in this area between, you know, whether the government should take a stronger hand or whether the market – uh, forces are enough, and and you know it, what's going to be the effect on innovation, and so you know we can all we all know those arguments, and we can all have that conversation. I think uh, what concerns me the most is that uh, we can't we're running out of you know we've run out of time to have that conversation at least at some level, and that we need to get something done. So uh, we are getting things done. There are a lot of things that are going forward, but on this point about um, you know getting back to uh, where we you know. Uh, have some things that are maybe required, um, you know, uh, in a way that's not, uh, does not uh, unnecessarily uh, reduce, you know, increase costs or make the U.S. companies non-competitive or all the other problems. Uh, you know, we do need to move forward on this, and we are, you know, time is short. Uh, so again, uh, let's get something done in this Congress and, um, you know, see how that goes. We, it won't be perfect, but uh, it will be at least moving the ball. And I have to apologize. I have to go out of this a little bit early. So, um, What I like about uh, all three of the national efforts that were mentioned is the fact that they facilitate uh, and really streamline the notification process and really help ISPs um, do something which we know ISPs are the best positioned organizations to do, and that's to notify customers uh, of infections. Uh, what I th think all three haven't gotten quite right, or certainly uh, not quite right by an American standard, is balancing the need for shared uh, educational and support resources for consumers with also facilitating access to the vast marketplace of products and services 
that are already out there in the private sector uh, and available to uh, consumers and making it easy for consumers to find those resources and connect with the ones that are most suited to their needs. I think we could do uh, better in that area um, and I haven't seen it in any of the other three uh, countries so far. I would say um, that in Australia, um, the, uh, I, I think they've done a great job incentivizing the uh, ISPs to participate. They have 90% participation, um, and uh, the, it, they've given them reasons uh, that, that it, would, it makes sense to sign up, including some of the, uh, um, the ideas about uh, giving them benefits for, for uh, get, getting consumers, sending consumers back to them to um, address some of the, the issues. Um, it, where where appropriate, um, I I didn't really like the I, I think I think the U S in general has done a better job in education than that site does. If you look at that the educational tools on that site, uh, the U S uh, versions are better. Uh, uh, the U S information that's out there is better. Um, on in terms of the German, it's hard for me to know because my German's uh, not that good. So um, they have very long words. <laughs> the uh, <laughs> that I can't follow all the time. Um, but the, uh, it is, I think that they've, uh, th they certainly have done a better job in terms of de describing what their goals are and talking about how uh, they plan to get there. Um, I look forward to seeing their measurements and to whether they're meeting that, the, those goals and then it would be more interesting to kind of look through the hand-holding piece versus just the education piece that they've been doing. So just the download piece and see um, how those work and why they work or not and get some German language experts to look at what they've done. Uh, well, I, I guess uh, I can say that the company certainly have looked at the other models around the globe very carefully and um, I guess I'll comment on the Australian model and say that a lot of what is in that document, U.S. providers have been doing for quite some time. I'd say, you know, 90% of that is something that, you know, U.S. companies are already doing. And in fact, you can use that as a good example of what companies do without government intervention in this area. Um, I think the difference between the approaches really demonstrates the difference in culture and in the different legal structures and um, in our technological solutions. So, Whereas they may be something that we can look to, they are probably not analogous to the U.S. market. We have time for one more question. So why don't I, uh, the fellow in the back there in the blue shirt. Rick Fort, uh, I'm a consultant at an IT services company. Uh, I'd like to say thank you very much to the panel and to the speakers. Uh, it was a great event today. Uh, very educational. My question is, uh, I understand that ISPs play a very direct role in computer security, but can, uh, should we expect uh, ISP implemented security solutions to have as positive and, and as uh, effective uh, effects on uh, addressing the problem of malware uh, with mobile devices? Or are there complications in the mobile realm because you have uh, an extra layer of content control from the phone companies? Thank you. It was too good. Yeah. I, I think if anything, um, you know, I, ISPs in the mobile space probably have, have more potential uh, uh, to drive security. I mean, you see it in the relatively locked down uh, environment of the Apple uh, App Store. Um, and, and, and the fact that by exerting so much control over uh, over the devices, uh, you know, uh, the the net impact is being able to uh, to provide better security, uh, less user choice at times, but but more security. Um, you know, I, so so I'm, I don't think that it, you know. I, I'm, I'm not that concerned about that distinction. What I am concerned about in the mobile space is the fact that particularly as more people get accustomed to using Wi-Fi on their devices um, and, uh, and sort of roaming around with devices from Wi-Fi access point to access point, uh, who's detecting and notifying those people? Um, you know, it's one thing when, when you're talking about a home computer sitting uh, on somebody's home internet connection. It's quite another when you're talking about an iPad um, that maybe the person doesn't tend to use much at home because they have a computer there, but they use the iPad out on the road a lot. Um, you know, or 
Samsung Galaxy Tab or some other Android device, um, and now that device has malware, uh, I, I think you will see problems with uh, ISPs. Uh, if we're looking to ISPs to be the primary notifier and primary support provider, I think uh, that will cause some new challenges. I was just going to say that uh, um, I mean this is uh, it's a very good question, but uh, you know one of the things that I think it, it, this is one of the reasons that it's important to look beyond ISPs, right? And we we do have um, other companies in this space that have done notification that um, have looked into this issue, and I think there are a lot of players in um, understanding uh, the future of the mobile um, information flow. I think it's going to be important to figuring out how to best uh, tackle this problem in the mobile space. So that's something that we would be interested in comments on the RFI as well. And I think I'd just reiterate what Ari just said in that um, it, it is a very good question. It's, it brings us back to the idea that it, it cannot rest solely on the ISP to provide you know, thorough internet security directly to the consumer. Um, but I will say that you know we recognize that there's a role to play. We, we agree with the outline of prevention, detection, notification, remediation. It's just now having a national debate on who you know best fits into what different categories and what are the different roles that people should play. Um, and you may find that ultimately the companies may want to have a direct relationship with the customer and provide greater end user security and some won't be able to because of the way that they operate or because of their size, et cetera. So we need to make sure that that remains open and flexible as you know we move forward. Thanks. Okay, well, Ari, um, can you, for those who I'm sure most have seen it, but can you point us to where we can find the RFI? Is there a website address or something? I guess the best place for me to send you is through the uh, Internet Policy Task Force at the Commerce Department. We have a website there that's run by NTIA, and there's a cybersecurity section. The top link is going to be the uh, um, the RFI, but uh, it's it, you know it's available uh, um, on the or through the Federal Register. You can do a search for it. Tremendous. Um, would you join me in thanking our panel today? Uh, thank you for coming.